Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. You know that feeling in the pit of your stomach deep down that you get? You mean Taco Bell over the age of 25? No, Nick, not Taco Bell. I'm talking about instinct. That's right. We're going to be talking about instinct, that gut feeling that you have. Is it real? How's it developed in human history? And should you listen to it? But before we get into that, Nick, how are you doing? What are you drinking? I am doing amazing. Drinking some Irish coffee. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Caffeinating up with some uh, energy drink and drinking some native whiskey. So I'm a happy camper because you technically bought me that whiskey, so it works out. That's what friends are for. So instinct. I think the best way to describe it is first with the dictionary, the term, what it actually defines. Instinct, according to Webster Dictionary, is a natural or inherent aptitude, impulse, or capacity, a large, inheritable, untraceable tendency of an organism to make it a complex and scientific response to environmental stimuli without involving reasoning. I think that's just a bunch of fancy words of going, you don't know why you did it, but you did it. So the difference between instinct and reflexes, a reflex is something that happens without involving your brain, right? You touch a hot pan, the doctor hits your knee, you move your leg. There's no reasoning there. That's just an automatic response to stimuli. Instinct like you said, is that gut feeling. It comes from somewhere. You can't quite figure out why you're doing it, but something inside your brain is telling you to make whatever action based on whatever you're perceiving. I think that's a great way to distinguish instinct versus reaction because reaction is just nerves. Like if you hit, if you heat metal, the metal will warp because, well, that's just how it is. That's just a structural thing. Instinct, that gut feeling, that's... That's on a deeper level. That's on a neuron level, which we'll get to later on. But instinct is not just in humans. Instinct is, well, every living organism has instinct in one form or another. Well, maybe not people named Kyle, but instinct does exist. And it's a debate whether instinct is learned, passed along, or both, which... We'll get into in a minute, but I want to talk about the history of how we discovered instinct. So instinct, well, since the ancient Greeks, we've talked about instinct, but it wasn't until William Wundunt came along in about the 1880s where he decided to write about instinct. And according to him, he developed over 4,000 or classified over 4,000 human instincts that drive behavior. So smells aromas cosmetics you know the reason why we like certain shapes etc cetera, etc cetera. and then along came william mcdonald he made his list a little bit shorter nick they went from 4000 to 18 and then if we go a little bit longer in history sigmund freud it's philosophy he always pops up one way or the other he simplified it to a version now i'm not the biggest fan of sigmund freud i mean well A lot of his stuff is cuckoo, but it does merit some truth. He boiled it down to two instincts. The sex instinct, the instinct to produce life, to carry on your genetic code, and the death instinct, simply the instinct of avoiding dying or hurting yourself, which, as much as I'm not the biggest fan of Floyd, I think merits some truth. Wouldn't you say so, Nick? Yeah, and I I think when you break it down like that, I like to break things down so things are simple, don't get me wrong, but I think that's going a little bit too far down to the base. I completely agree. Um, I was going to, I don't know what you, I was going to, do you want to talk about specific instincts that humans have? Actually, I might get a little nerdy with you. I want to talk about some, since we mentioned ancient Greeks, I want to talk about one that's kind of named after the ancient Greek. The heuristic technique. It is a approach to a problem or self-discovery or hippie stuff that employs a method that 
is not guaranteed, optimal, or rational. But nonetheless, it is a significant ability to reach a short-term goal. So pretty much you're using this technique to rationalize something that might be irrational to just come up with a solution and make a quick decision. And I think that's kind of on an evolutionary base how instinct started. And I think that kind of goes into what you're about to go into, Nick, about certain types of instincts. Like if we see a shadowy creature in the dark, our first instinct is that might be a predator, might be scared, might be run away, and that eventually might get passed on in our gene line. Is that kind of what you're going for with types of uh, instincts? Yeah, stuff that, like, like we talked about, humans are born with. These aren't taught things. People are afraid of the dark. People are afraid of loud noises. That's this is kind of where I was going. Perfect. Let's go straight into it. And I think that kind of fits real with the heuristic technique because that's, to me, instinct is something not long-term. I don't know if you agree with that, but instinct is kind of within a 20-minute window of kind of like, what's happening? Let's make a quick decision. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So since you brought up like evolutionary thing, I thought it was really fascinating that all kind of mammals immediately after birth know inherently to know to cling to their mothers to for survival like that instinct of parenthood that instinct of passing on your gene line protecting your gene line that is all stuff you are born with and that is extremely extremely fascinating with me yeah uh imprinting i think is the term there is yeah as soon as you are born you cling to you know your mom or a mother figure and it's even like uh like if you have like a new cat or something or like a a young cat and you immediately take it away it seems like it'll cling to you know the like the woman of the house or whatever like or you uh, i think ducks too like if you take a duck away when it's really young it'll follow around like the first like person it sees and thinking that it's its mother like it's an instinct to just latch on to that first pit thing you see as your protector because most of the times it is your mother out of curiosity nick i didn't come across this in my research and i don't expect you to know but i feel like the imprint imprinting of a false mother or motherhood figure tends to be a mammal based uh feature i in my mind i can't think of any fish reptile or well i guess bird you did just mention duckling with bird but that's a mammal Right? Would a duck be... Is a duck a mammal? We're going to have to cut this out because I don't know. I think so. <laughs> I don't fucking know. <laughs> but I find that very fascinating how we naturally have an instinct to find a motherhood figure. And the answer is no, a duck is not a mammal. I'm just an idiot. Same. Which, I don't know. Uh, I think there's a specific word for it. If I remember correctly, it's intism, which is a psychology or philosophical idea that you are your mind is born with ideas and knowledge and not all knowledge is learned but you're born with which i was gonna say is doesn't sound like a theory or an idea it kind of sounds like it's truth like lightning strike nick we were talking about the fear the darkness the monsters the finding the mother i don't know any creature that does not fear lightning no and so kind of explain some of this as every creature evolved or okay they evolved because of pressures so let's say we'll take humans for example who started living in you know small communities a lightning strike comes causes a fire the people who were because not everyone at one point or another was afraid of lightning probably by that time pretty much everyone was but the people who were afraid would run away right and the people who weren't wouldn't, and then they'd get burnt over. And then suddenly all the people who are, are afraid of lightning, their genes get passed on. That The fear of loud noises is passed on to people, to their offspring. It's kind of a simple way of looking at it. Yeah, actually, I came across a really interesting, I think it was um, Professor Hawking's, not the physicist, the biological professor, had a really great analogy describing this passing of trait of, instinct uh there's a bird that cracks open 
snails shells with uh i guess they call it like an anvil like it, it kind of like hammers the snails against a rock or something like that till the sh shell breaks well the first clever bird to find that out in his, his gene line way back in the day probably taught its young how to do that and that young how to do that and that instinct that developed trait that ability to survive better allowed that creature to pass on its genes more to survive more to and that naturally got built into the system because there's a lot of birds who will live like on the same island or territory that don't do that so they're happy to eat the snail insides but they don't know how to crack the snail open and i think that's what you're kind of going for nick where having the instinct made our ancestors or ancestors of other species survive so that if it worked once it'll probably work again just keep doing it and you'll keep surviving Exactly. And it's crazy to think that we're alive because our ancestors survived over millions and millions and millions of years, and now we're here. Like, just, we are all children of survivors. Like, you can't not be. <laughs> <laughs> you said it the best. We are children of survivors. People and creatures and organisms simply trusting their gut instinct of, you hear twig snap? That might be a predator. Run. We might hear some, you might catch a scent in the wind. You don't know what that is? Nope. Not dealing with that with a day. Oh, you hear a noise and it said this time running, you investigate. Oh, you found this new type of food so you get better. The, the I would say, Nick, only the reason we are here today is by sheer luck and trusting our ancestors, trusting their gut instincts. Pretty much. And uh, it's, it's funny you say that, and it always goes back to one of these things, but uh, like when I'm out in the woods and I'm in an area where I see like some mountain lion shit or I see a paw print or something and I hear like a loud snap, I'm like, oh, fuck. But if I don't have see any sign of them and I hear a snap, I'm just like, whatever. Like I'm not as alert, I guess. But once I recognize that there's predators in this area, I'm a lot more alert. Oh, completely agree. If I, 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 I'll be honest, I'm more nervous when I'm in the middle of the woods and I see signs of fresh humans than I am of wildlife. For some reason, I fear our own species more than other creatures. Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty standard. Yeah. I mean, another competitor that wants the same goals as you, it's, it's quite compulsive to want to be cautious of that, but it's very, I want to, I want to set this precedent. The instinct between humans and animals split somewhere along the line. Yes, we still have the survival instincts of a mother wanting to protect her young born, the hear strange noise in the dark and wanting to be cautious, not knowing what something is and being afraid of it. That's very human nature and just nature in general. But instinct goes further than that, which we'll talk about later in the podcast. I just want to set that precedent early here, talking about since we're talking about evolutionary instinct. Yeah, so while we're still talking about kind of fear, not social instinct right now, I'm talking about snakes and spiders. Snakes I like and snakes, spiders. don't like spiders. <laughs> well, you're weird, and that's... What, you don't like snakes? No, I'm like Indiana Jones, dude. <laughs> I don't like <laughs> snakes. There's, there is a lot of people who like snakes, which is, I think, interesting because humans don't need, they don't need to grow up around snakes to recognize the fear of snakes. Ch children from a young age, for the most part, know snakes and spiders are bad. It's something that people just, like, it's an instinct. And I thought that was cool that we've grown with up with snakes and spiders for so long that we just know they're not to be trusted. <laughs> don't trust that sneaky snake. To, to add on to that, Nick, I didn't see snakes and spiders, but I did see some color recognition. So with bright colors, we are more both attractive and more cautious with, like the poison dart frogs in, um, in South America. The reason why they're bright colors is to show that predators that they're poisonous, so they would avoid them. So when we see, I imagine this is how it is, I, I'm just taking an educated guess here, when we see bright colors on a creature that happens to be a snake, we might be more nervous of them. But I, that is, I do love that, how 
we might not ever see them or interact with them, but immediately know that is bad, that is dangerous, that is no no. Yeah, yeah. We we never. You don't have to grow up. Or I mean, probably everyone grew up around spiders, but not everyone grew up around snakes. But people know snakes aren't good. Children from a young age who haven't been socially molded to, you know, say know that snakes are bad. And yeah, there's a lot of snakes in cartoons and stuff. They usually end up being the bad guys. But I forgot what age. I think the kids are like six years old or something, which is old enough to know. But I don't know. I I, I do think that we can inherently look at snakes and spiders and say that they're bad or instinctually i mean i know women definitely have that instinct i think it's some of the men that are lacking it (laughs) yeah it pays to be dumb nick that just keeps coming up but this is a little bit off topic but i just want to set this i am curious on how long instinct lasts because my first thought was what about tribes in the north arctic the as the uh what's it called the tribes north of alaska the Inuits? Inuits, thank you. Because they don't have spiders, I don't believe, that far north, or snakes. So, and they've been, their ancestry goes back to that land for, God, thousands of years. Do they still have that instinct of snakes are bad? Like, how long does instinct last in DNA? I would be willing to bet that they still have it. I'll take your word for it, because I'm 50-50 on it. I have no idea. But think of how long humans have been around and yeah they've been up there a long time but it's still descended from somewhere and this is i'll give you this example and i really i just kind of was thinking about this so i didn't really research it i read it in a book somewhere a long time ago um these people these american soldiers were lot were shot down during world war ii and they're on a life raft for fucking like forever i like 30 days or something and they were catching fish to survive but they uh, weren't getting all their nutrients and stuff and instinctually their bodies were like man those eyes look super appetizing like the eyes of the fish because the eyes had some nutrients that the soldiers needed and so they ate the eyes of the fish and that was what saved them because they needed those nutrients to survive even though they had like the fish and stuff I, i forget exactly how long they were out there but they knew that they needed whatever those fish eyes had they didn't like they didn't know they were missing like whatever protein or vitamin was in there they had no idea but their body made the eyes appear the most appetizing piece of that fish and i've cooked and cleaned a lot of fish in my lifetime never (laughs) those gooey talk about life finds a way but nick i want to though i completely agree with you I want to be devil's advocate and and implement a counter argument because I also know of a story that I read a long time ago about the Darwin Awards where a man at a zoo couldn't figure out what if the bear was a male or female. So he hopped over the fence and kicked it in its nether regions to figure out if it's a male or a female. You have one on one side, you have humans not knowing that they are missing nutrients, but their body, their brain, their DNA, knowing like, hey, we need something like that. Let's try the fish eyes. And on the other half, you have a human who is perfectly safe, has food, deciding to do something very, very dumb and risking their life for something very, very stupid. Yes. So you're getting into a separate debate about how we have essentially stopped natural selection from occurring with our population. And Certain genes that should be getting weeded out are not getting weeded out because. All right, don't well, don't go any further because we're definitely gonna do a podcast on that. That is a perfect podcast talk. Yeah, that's uh, I mean, yeah, that's where the Darwin Awards come from, right? Like, these <laughs> people shouldn't be alive. If you want to kick a bear, I, well, you are whatever. you are safe. You hop over a fence to kick a bear in the nuts. You was sir, he in Florida? Was this in Florida? I don't think so. I think he. I think this also was a person who brought their child to it, and the child asked, so the parent, the father, hopped over the fence to figure it out. Which means the movie *Idiocracy* becomes closer and closer to reality every single day. Doesn't they have a the show about just people getting kicked in the balls? I have in *Idiocracy*. No. Oh yes, they do. <laughs> I forgot about that. 
Um, so speaking of society, I was going to talk about instincts that for come up in, like we talk about a tribe, a close knit group. So there's, I think there's two kind of instincts. You have your survival instinct, and then you have your your social instinct. And your social instinct is, what can you do in your group to stay relevant? For example, if there's someone in your group who is bad, like uh, whatever, they're stealing food or whatever, but they're still part of the tribe, you want to get rid of them or you need to live with them, but you don't want to leave the group. So you have all these social instincts about how to act in this community because leaving the group means dying, but you need to stay within the group if you want to survive, but you don't like this guy. He's not good for you. He's not good to you. And so you need to navigate that situation. Yeah, even though it's not the best for that short-term scenario, it's better for a long-term scenario. So even though your instinct says kill him, remove him, you're controlling that instinct to realize like, hey, I need this. Uh, If I may intervene here, Nick, I don't know if you came across uh, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I don't know if that came across in your research. Um, I didn't... research it but i know i understand like the basis of it okay for those listening i'll go real fast it's a five-step pyramid the first two on the base of the pyramid is safety food water basic needs the next two is like self-esteem love connection community physical uh psychology needs the top one being goals making sure like you're self-fulfilled you're happy doing things you want, kind of selfishness. That's kind of the pyramid. And and Nick, I think that fits perfectly with a tribe because you need food, water, and safety. That's the foundation. So at all costs, protect that. Use your instinct to make sure you have those fundamental things needed. Those fundamental things are in your life, even though it might be the sacrifice of other things. You might not want to. You might not even think about why you're doing it, but your gut feeling goes, okay, Food, water first, other stuff later. Yeah. And so you have, we have social instincts that help us navigate in this environment. One of those is judging people. We judge people by their looks. We judge people by their body language. And that's something that humans can inherently do, right? You can kind of, and certain people are better at lying, certain people aren't, but you can tell when someone is acting mean when someone is being aggressive so you start reading their their body right i this i don't remember if this is 100 percent true but if i remember this is way back in the day that 90 or 80 percent of all humans the first thing they do when they see a new person is look them up and down and then look at their shoes they do a huge identification based on what footwear you're wearing so you judge them based on that that that's instinct that's just i i I imagine that's got to go back to looking up a up and down a predator species saying hey do they have talons on their feet or maybe even more recent history like hey are they wearing sandals are they wearing boots are they wearing military gear are they socks with sandals people no don't that is blasphemy nick you never the only time that's available is slip on Black sandals with long black socks. That is not great, but if you need to grab something from your mailbox, that is fine. If you're wearing white sand, white sandals, and or any color sandals and white socks, that's a no no. That is, you do not do that, and I will put my foot down on that. I'm gonna agree with you, but you are attacking my people. I will, uh, I I will wage war against your people. It will be the sock with sandals versus the normal Polish human people. people. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, obviously we, like, we judge people who wear socks and sandals. I'm sorry. That's the world we live in today. I am not sorry. I will, I, if that, if that is my only prejudice of hating people wearing socks with sandals, I am completely okay with it. So, yeah. So you, you judge people and you, you kind of figure out where they're coming from. But here's another thing you do that everyone does that is instinctual. And that is gossip. Gossip is a way inside of your community to spread information and basically just establish what's moral, what isn't, who's doing the right thing, and who isn't. And 
we know gossip today be- as seems like inherently bad, right? Like you're not supposed to gossip, not supposed to talk about people behind their backs. But that's how we've evolved with that. That's instinctual to us. That's something that we do, even though we know we're not supposed to. That's really weird to me. I never thought about that or came across that of, of how gossip is a evolutionary thing of talking about what a person did. Did they help the tribe? Did they not help the tribe? Were they good? Did they steal? That's all gossip. That's all relaying information inside your own tribe. I never thought about that, Nick. That's kind of mind-blowing. Yeah, and uh, I forgot to bring it up in morality, but that's when I stumbled across it. But yeah, that's how we interact in a society, a small tribe. We need to know everything about each other in order to survive. I was going to say, to elaborate more on psychology and social instinct, I would say humans, I think all creatures, not just humans, are scared of the unknown are scared of things that look different. I think that's a fair assessment. So like you said, Nick, where we judge people by they look, well, if we see similarities in their clothing, so say say someone grew up in a suburb and their parents wore khakis and a button-up, you would naturally want to find those people if you're in a foreign environment, or if you see someone wearing that in a place you've never been to, naturally gravitate towards them, go towards them. I think that's all instinct, whether you think about it or not, that's just your instinct of trying to find other tribe members or familiarity that you're used to. Yeah, and we kind of talked about that in fashion, too, where you gravitate towards people who are dressed like you. It's all connected, Nick. Everything's always connected. (laughs) So there's another thing that we do that's instinctual, and that's, it doesn't, may not always seem like it, but that's sharing. Sharing is something that humans do, apes do as well, and so say there's there's a system there, right? Now, if you share everything, you don't have enough for yourself. But if you don't share, you won't be accepted into the tribe. So you have to share enough with people in your tribe to survive, but you also need to hold some for yourself. And the people who are we're descended from today were able to maintain that balance of hunting or gathering enough resources to tr- to share with everyone else to keep everyone alive as well as themselves, but not overexerting and sharing too much and not leaving enough for themselves, or on the other end, not sharing and getting kicked out of the tribe and then not surviving. Though I agree with your statement, I feel like there's more to it. I feel like there's like There is a lot more to it. Because Okay, so I'm going to keep going. So sharing food establishes social structure, right? The people who share more, they usually end up higher. And then you can trade for other stuff. So bartering, you know, giving some blackberries for some venison whatever bartering is also something that occurs in humans and apes as well that's i think it's got to be instinctual right i mean it's it's in a sense another thing that i think is instinctual a competition okay humans compete in everything like literally everything (laughs) i mean as a man i've had some of the dumbest competitions over the dumbest things Like, who can sit in cold water the longest? Who can do what? Like, just I mean, we come up with a term they calling pissing contests for a reason. That's completely true. But yeah, so competition and is kind of like bartering, and then all of these are ways to sharing and bartering. Competition is ways to establish a hierarchy, and it's pretty normal in societies to have hierarchies, right? You know, from you have like leaders of a tribe to presidents, kings. I mean, it. humans have had a leader. Humans have had leaders and everyone has a desire to obtain status and sharing and bartering and competition are ways that we do that. And people can argue and say that we don't need a hierarchy but history has shown that we continue to establish hierarchies. We establish leaders. We choose leaders. And I mean, I don't think there's any nation, tribe, whatever you want to call it, that's been run as a community if it's over like 70 people. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, you need order. Um, uh, this might be a little bit off topic, but the best analogy I ever heard for having the purpose of having a leader is... An arrow doesn't fly straight unless it has a tip of a point. 
And I want to elaborate and question you, Nick, because you brought up some interesting points that I, I'm very curious about. So you're talking about sharing. I want to start with that one. I feel like there's a basic human instinct of mercy, of showing mercy, not just to humans. I mean, animals developed babies to be cute as hell. I mean, come on, look at a baby kitten or puppy. You can't help but love it. I'm wondering if that instinct of thinking it's adorable or cute is simply a biological f factor to help survive longer. If it looks cuter, there's a lesser chance of killing it or eating it. Would What's your opinion on that, Nick? Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree that there's some there's something there, right? Humans are drawn to kittens and, and puppies and, and cute furry animals. And whether, I mean, I, maybe that is, this is just a random leap, a guessing game here, so don't take this as any sort of scientific net guess. And maybe that's because we kn we knew you had to let the young of other species live if you wanted to harvest them later, or just, I don't know, that we'd feel bad if we killed puppies? I, I don't know. But no, there, that's, there is something there. That's a good point. I never thought about that, of it's not useful now, but it might be useful later. So our instinct might be like, let it survive, like a, like a puppy wolf. It's not useful as a puppy, but older can help us hunt, help protect us. It might be long-term thinking for humans. I, I, never, I didn't think about that. And my second part to what you said is the hierarchy. People naturally fall into a role, I would say. That's just kind of nature of every species. Someone finds where they, they belong, kind of fits that niche. So I wonder if there's an instinct of being docile or being aggressive. So if your ancestors way down the line were more the apex, more the alpha, will you have a higher chance of being the alpha? Is that your instinct role to take over and become king, so to speak? Or if a lot of your ancestors were beta just simply to survive in the tribe, does that pass into your genome of the instinct of being submissive, instinct of not aspiring to be the leader? Is that part of our evolutionary biology? Is that part of our instinct? Is that, Or is that just on more nature versus nurture? Is that more just how you're raised kind of scenario? I think that is more how you were raised, just based like on birth order, you're more likely to be have a more aggressive or riskier career if you're the first born, right? There's nothing, not a, I mean, there's genetics are always involved, but it seems like that has a larger role in passing that on than your genetics. So leaders are made, not born. Okay. I, I kind of agree with that statement. I, I definitely believe scenario has a huge part of it. I'm just, Maybe it was just a food for thought of does your position in a hierarchy matter what your ancestors were in a position of a hierarchy? Yeah. Uh, I personally, I, I don't think so. Um, there is one thing we kind of forgot to mention that would have tied all this together. Social and, and, and predator prey instinct kind of stuff is play. Humans, animals, the young play. You can see that in puppies and, you know, like bears, if you're lions. looking at young bears, lions, all of these animals play. They, the young run, run around and wrestle with each other. They'll bite the parents. And the parents will pretend like they're hurting them. There, it's, there's so many examples of play that I think that's, in, that's something that's instinctual in pretty much a lot of the animals. Oh, yes, I would completely agree. Play is almost a simulation, practice, run through, uh, just trying to figure out what works and doesn't work. It's play is is an instinct of survival without the risk or consequences, I would say. Which makes me curious because I didn't research this, this Nick. I play did not come across my research in general, but I imagine most creatures that play are larger brain compared to smaller. I feel like like fish. Fish is just you're born, you go, let's go. There's not really much play. It's just thrown into the water to learn how to swim. Get, get it, fish, swim. Uh, <laughs> Nick loves my puns. But I feel like with like lions, like you said, mentioning like parents pretending that they're hurt when the cub bites them, that practice is much higher thinking. It's getting that instinct of killer survival going. 
versus the instinct you're just born with for lesser creatures, smaller mind creatures of this is what you need to do to survive. Just keep doing this and go. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I'm just trying to think of, I, I, I'd say 98% confident. I don't think fish play. I'm trying to think of like birds. I don't think they really do either. I see them messing with each other, but I think that's not uh, not playful. I think that's a competition for resources, whether it be space or something. I I don't know. Don't know, but I think ravens, crows, and penguins kind of play. But it I don't quote me on the play for that sentence because I know like ravens and crows will purposely mess with the creatures for their own entertainment. Um, it might not even be their own species that they'll they'll mess with. And I know ravens and crows will trade with humans for more, for food. Like they'll bring shiny items to opt to humans for food. That, I don't know if that's instinct or learned. And I don't know if their play is running through simulations of real life scenarios or just simply crows and ravens being dicks, which makes them one of my favorite creatures. Yeah, I don't know. Crows, they, they are pretty fucking smart though. We have or ravens, whatever you want to call them, out in the woods, and with the planting crew or any kind of crew at lunch, they'll you know throw out like the the rest of the apple or the bottom of the tortilla or something. And this might be an area where the crows weren't before, or where humans weren't before, but the crows know like okay, once they gather. As soon as we leave, it's just like a, a feeding frenzy. They come in and eat whatever the guys didn't eat. And it's like, they, we haven't had... And there's areas where there's a lot of human activity, but some of these areas, there's not that much human activity. And it's like, how do they know that immediately after these humans come to sit together and leave, it's it's time to eat? It's their gut feeling. They see humans. They know possibility of food. Humans. That means trash. <laughs> You're not wrong, but since we're kind of tying all creatures together, I think instinct for higher thought creatures is definitely a more learned trait compared to instinct for dumber creatures. Well, dumber might not be the right word, but like again, some insects, birds, fish, they just kind of plug and play. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. I don't really see much evolutionary change to their instincts. Birds, mammals, they they have the ability to adapt more, to change their instinct of, okay, we used to fear this, but now we know what it is, so now we can pass that on into our genome, and now we're not naturally afraid of it. We're not naturally uh, cautious of it, or we're not naturally attracted to it. We, we learn, and then we pass that instinct on to our offspring. I feel like higher learning creatures have the ability to change their instinct far more greater at a larger range than small brain creatures, so to speak. Yeah, so I'm going to give one example. So fish, uh, pre- predators would be mammals, like bears, humans, and then birds, hawks, ospreys, you know, large birds that come in and pick the fish out of the water. So what do they look for? Shadows. Shadows, it's a great indicator that something is coming. Whether it's a shadow of a bird flying over or human walking along the bank, a shadow will spook a trout. So they should fear the shadows. But if they're raised in a hatchery, as people walk over and then they throw the food in, they start to associate shadows with the food. And they don't really fear the shadows because it might just be a person walking by that it's not coming to kill them and then when they put these hatchery fish out they see these shadows it might be a human bear bird whatever and they just they don't run and hide whereas the native fish will hide which is why they you can dump a lot of hatchery fish into the wild it doesn't mean they're all going to make it and they're doing stuff to counteract that they'll they'll um do no like no shadow feeding where they don't see the shadow so they don't associate it with food but yeah so i don't think that instinctually the fish start fearing the shadow until they start seeing their friends being killed off because of it 
And I don't know if you, we wanted to go here yet, but when you were talking about changing their instinct, humans are probably the only species that ignores their instincts. I agree with that statement, but I also would say the fish with the shadow is an instinct. That's just uh, correlating two different features. I wouldn't say that's instinct. I think instinct is, in my mind, instinct is something that's irrational. Like, you see, if you always see a shadow when you eat food, you associate the two together. But I, I wouldn't say that's irrational. I would just say that's correlation. To me, instinct is something you can't put in words. Instinct is something on a scale. Scale consciously, you can't control. Like fear. Fear is, there's a difference between being scared and fear. Fear, being scared is like, okay, this is an immediate threat. Fear is kind of unknown. It's not 100% certain. You don't understand it. It's just your instinct telling you, be afraid of this. So I think there's a difference between association and instinct with the fish. And to answer your, and I think, Nick, you are right. I think humans might be the only creatures dumb enough or smart enough to overcome their instinct. I think that's a dual-edged sword. Yeah, so there's a ton of examples of this, but because now we govern ourselves in a society by like a like a, an unwritten code of conduct, right? So if you're walking alone at night or something and you see some people who you you have an instinct, you have a sense that something's not right. Any other animal would just run. A deer would just take off. If it's not sure, it's out of there. But we don't want to offend people. Whatever it is, you're not just going to start running away. That's something that humans don't really do. And a lot of times it doesn't end good for us as humans to just ignore instinct. Our body is right. A lot of times, there's if so, you, if you feel something's not right... You're picking up something from those people around you or something that there's a danger here. Like you said, you can't quite say what it is. But because of our social construct we have with each other, we're not going to run away in fear. We're going to just act like nothing is wrong. And this happens a lot. And it usually, you know, might be like a mugging or something. Not the worst. Not that that's good, but it, it could be worse. And... I don't know. It's like, I get it. I get why we don't do it. And I've been in situations like that where like you're walking at night or something and you see someone, you know, some guy walking with their hood up and you're like, okay, that's not, that's not good. Nope. Not you know? today. Not dealing with that today. <laughs> yeah. And so you run, to, you get to the other side of the street or something and you kind of watch and see what they're doing. But yeah, it's, but you you fight that instinct because you don't just want to run because then that's people be like, well, that's rude. What if it's just some guy who is cold? But your body's like, there's something that's not right about that guy. Don't trust him. Well, imagine our ancestors trying to figure out what's edible or what's not edible. That instinct to try something or to watch someone or the instinct to do something dangerous that's life-threatening just for the thrill of it. I mean, I imagine there's lots of religions and cultures and kind of tribal things that we do that instinctively doesn't make sense but yet we do it anyhow just to either show that we're willing to sacrifice for the tribe we're willing to just try new things or just human instinct to attempt might not be the smartest thing to do but just attempt and i don't know about you nick but i don't know if it's just how i was raised or my biological instinct of when i walk into a new area i assess the situation i'm like oh, where are the exits How, who is a possibility of a threat that just biology but i've had instances where i go i should punch this person in the face i don't know them i don't know why but just something about their structure their the way they moved just they might be a physical threat to my tribe i should remove them even though my instinct says to do this i still control that instinct and not do it ah going to kyle's house ha <laughs> ha we're picking on kyle a lot today but yeah no um definitely like there there's things you just can't do in a society and yeah it's part of that we know there's something not right whatever and yeah your instincts can be wrong and it's that risk assessment that your brain does your instinct is just like another piece of information that you have to process 
you know that this guy there or something isn't right. You're trying to figure out what it is. And then you have to figure out what to do with that information. You know there's something fishy. Do you run away? Do you just go up and punch him? I mean, and then your brain processes like what's going to happen socially, right? Am I going to get arrested? Am I going to look like a bad person for running away from this guy? Like, and then you have to weigh that risk. But all your instinct is doing is just giving you some information. And maybe it's right, maybe it's not. It seems to me like your instinct is your quick response to a situation. It's just your instinct is your first assessment of the situation, whether you like it or not. It's your brain processing through information that you can't put into words or something, other factors that you can't genetically or consciously put into context. So it's on the tip of your tongue. You don't. You might not know what's wrong with that person, but you just know something's up. You smell a certain scent. You feel a certain situation in the room. You just something that you can't put the, your finger on, but your instinct's telling you to do something. But now with society and hu- and humans having to adapt to other humans, we're, I don't know if we're able to control our instincts or we look at a larger view of our instincts of, well, our first instinct is our own survival, but short term and long term. So short term, this human being might be a threat to me and my loved ones. But long term, if I act upon those threats, it might make me more susceptible to danger in the future might get me kicked out of the tribe might mean lower chance of survival i completely agree with you nick i think humans might be the only ones to change their instinct the only ones i can maybe see is the ancestral wolf of the docile wolf or wolf kicked out of the tribe looking for food somehow budding budding with humans that it's probably going against their instincts, or it might be just desperation and they're doing their last draw. I honestly don't know. That makes sense. Pretty much it. I, I'm trying to think if there's something with like maybe elephants and just how they interact with humans in well, certain it is, parts of the world. It is very universal. I think it's with elephants as well. Is when we hear an infant cry, a young, high schooling peak, that we're more parental. I I I think that carries on to most species of just that sound of a more infant and that kind of carries on to species to species. But something I want to add on to this is for humans is a hunch. I think that ties along with instinct and gut feeling quite well. Having a hunch is quite literally just chemicals. A hunch is a somatic oh god, I can't pronounce S O M O T I C marker and so it's a it's a chemical clue of what to do next that's your hunch it's your body releasing chemicals of trying to figure out what you should or should not do and that's i think a very important aspect that there's different kind of types of instincts there's instincts you're born with instincts you developed and instincts that are changed by chemicals yeah um i could see that speaking of a hunch I have a question of whether you think this activity is an inst- is instinctual or not, and that's exploration. I actually don't know. Do humans explore because instinctually we just we want to go out and explore, or do we go out because we need resources? But it just I don't know. It's it's one of those where I could see it going either way. My first thought to it comes to the feeling of being cramped i and contained uh, humans we don't do well in cages we don't do great in close encounter areas so i imagine some instincts are just you want to spread out you want to roam i imagine that's got to be a genetic factor that's passed down from generation to generation of wanting to spread your wings and fly you know, birds gotta fly, fish gotta swim, humans gotta explore new lands and fuck everything up. So, I that's my first instinct, but I don't truly know. That is a fantastic question, Nick. Yeah, I like what you said about it. Things getting too cramped, like caves, caves too cramped. Got to go find a new one. Split half the tribe or something. And it's more of a there's uh, too many people, not enough resources here. So I could I could definitely see that, but it's just weird. 
I mean, what something's pushed us all over the globe more so than most other animals. Yes. Now this this might be a leap, but I I I want to because this is a really interesting question. Nick. I quite like this question. I know for lions, eventually the male cubs will be pushed out to start their own territory, and for humans, since we have more complex thinking, I'm wondering if the basis for taking some people with us and exploring is having an instinct for the grass is greener on the other side. We've all heard that saying, grass is greener on the other side. Maybe it's true. Maybe we have an instinct of thinking that the best future, the best land, the best food, the best shelter is nearly on the other side of the valley, is nearly on the other side of the mountain, merely merely on the other side of that lake. Maybe the instinct to find grazing lands, to find food, to find shelter, brings us to grass is always a greener side, thinking it can always be better and not to settle. Maybe that's where travel and exploration comes from. I do like that because I do think every human is a grass is greener on the other side kind of person. We're never satisfied. We always want to move up, make more money, have a bigger house, more land, whatever it is, more time. We always want more. So maybe it's greed that's instinctual that drove us to explore. I don't know if greed's the right word. It might be just a collective of resources to help further our gene line. Because I feel like greed is simply a word developed for tribe. It's, it, hey, he's greedy. He's taking more food than the rest of us. But the idea of self-preservation, the, to self-improve, to help your own tribe, to help your own bloodline i wouldn't say that's greedy i would say that's natural yeah i i I really do i i like the the grass is always greener because i think yeah it's you wanting something more you want more than what you currently have it's better somewhere else i guess a, a, i don't know strive striving to improve yeah that let's do a whole nother podcast on why do humans explore i think that'd be a good one <laughs> you go straight to sports i'd go straight to space but i have another sort of theory i kind of mimicked other theories and kind of put in different words and came up with my own theory of instinct i call it the copy and grow theory so instincts our basic fundamental instincts may come from our dna code you know it's developed and it forms and it's kind of our basic brain structure like we mentioned earlier all babies are born with some form of instinct which in turn is just setting our neutrons and our brain to a specific pattern so you're copying and pasting files you're copying and pasting a building to have certain structure to have a certain layout but as you get older and you learn, you're able to manipulate and train that structure. So imagine you have your neurons being wires for a complex electrical device, right? We'll just go with that. You, Everyone starts off with a set device. That's the wires are wired to A to A, B to B, C to C, because that's instinct. That's our genetic line being passed along, that's our DNA, just setting up those neurons to be that specific way. So that makes us think a specific way. But as cultures, society changes and we learn, we're able to unplug those wires and plug them into different ports, changing our instinct, changing our thought process, changing the way our neurons fire to process information and think about a scenario differently. And Nick, I'm curious on how you feel about that theory. So you're saying that, so what's doing the change? So I guess I'm kind of confused. So over time, our genetic code is changing or people are in response to stimuli changing the code that they pass down, I guess. I'm kind of confused. Kind of both. So everyone is born with a set amount of instinct that is from our ancestors. And through society and social situations and physical interactions, like, oh, you touched this pot, the pot's hot, you now know that that's, you know, fire bad. Just, you know, something that you interact with in your everyday life as you grow up, you gain more knowledge, more instinct, 
That is pass. Well, on. that's that'd be a reflex. All right, so your reflex is something you naturally know. Instinct might be able to learn from reflexes. So your reflex when you touch something hot is to take your hand away. The instinct now is when you see something red that it might be hot, and that might get passed on. So everyone started with the base model of our what our, our instinct is from our ancestors. So in the shadows, something might be dangerous. You hear a twig snap, might be a predator. That's our base code. And as we grow and develop into society, we add on to it or change and manipulate it. So then when we die and pass on our, our gene line, they now have our instinct. So it's growing upon each other, but everyone starts with a base model from our ancestors and then is added on based on society. I don't think that's how that works. So, so hang on. I, I have a. I understand what you're saying. Yep. All right. So we've all heard the saying, money doesn't grow on trees, right? I dispute that, but yes. Sh- shut your mouth. Uh, so if you are, all right, so everyone's born with a basic human needs, you know, food, water, shelter. And if money correlates to food, water, and shelter, and your parents, which now you're learning and developing skills from them, go, money doesn't grow on trees. So you associate money with food, water, and safety, and are a little bit more careful with your resources, being a little bit more frugal, being a little bit more cautious of your spending because you don't want to affect your food, water, and shelter. Food, water, shelter being a basic instinct. Money being a societal learning skill based on your parents and society. Then when you have a kid, you teach that trait to them. And that trait, you know, you keep doing that, doing that, doing that, doing that, copy and paste. It eventually becomes a basic instinct of money's important let's because money means survival uh kind of so i think that that's a learned behavior for an instinct to take effect it has to so you're having so it i think an instinct is baked into your genetic code somewhere it, it can't be acquired so what would I happen to, to spread instinct so this is what's this is how i think that would happen you have let's say two populations one population half the population one population two sides half the population associates green with money and they start becoming more prosperous the other half that doesn't associate green with money they won't become as prosperous they'll still reproduce as time goes on the side that associates green with money they'll have more and more children you'll still have a few of the non-associative side and then eventually over thousands of years pretty much most of the genes will be descended from the side that associates green with money as long as there's no other pressures i i think it's thousands it's not i don't think we can gain instincts in our modern society for the way we interact for another thousand years at least couple thousand probably more than that yeah probably a a long time so i think i I completely disagree with that i think instincts can be developed in one lifespan so well that's that's not an instinct then that's learned behavior yeah but learn all right yes and no to me learned behavior is a conscious choice instinct is something subconscious so like you mentioned earlier nick if you get mugged right? You might fear someone wearing a hoodie in the shadows where you can't see their face. I would say that's a learned instinct. But as you get mugged, you notice a tattoo, whether consciously or subconsciously, which now makes you more fearful of people with tattoos. I would say that's an instinct to fear people who have a certain trait. That's, I think the big difference is consciously versus subconsciously. And then when you raise your offspring... You go, okay, this person, when you assess a room, has this kind of feature. Well, I'm going to keep my offspring away from this certain feature. They might be, you know, you might have a bad instance with an ex who wears only red lipstick and red dresses. So you avoid those 
of, of those people. So when you have an offspring, you avoid those people. So that subconsciously might involve, hey, if I see these features, avoid these features. And that passes off onto your offspring. And that passes on to your offspring. I think instinct isn't something that's very hard to change. At least not change on an individual level, but change on a genetic level. So it's easy to pass on a trait to a next generation on instinct of if I always teach someone, like going back to the money issue, that money is very important, that will pass on to the next generation, that will pass on to the next generation. Yes, it could be, you can make the argument it's a learned skill, it's a, it's a process of information, but I would also say that's also affecting your instinct of money somehow. So when you want to spend money, whether so subconsciously you don't spend it even though you want to because you, your parents taught you to be saving your money and be frugal with your money and then their grandparents taught you to save money and be frugal with your money. I feel like that instinct is able to be manipulated much more than a thousand years. I think it could be manipulated within generations. I think you're looking at it very short term. Both of those things that you said are already instincts. They're just apply. You're applying them. So the instinct of identifying a dangerous person by their tattoo or a red dress, we already have the instinct of judging people. Now we're just putting the criteria in place of adding to the list of things we don't trust, red dresses, tattoos. Same goes back to the, the money. We, I talked about sharing and bartering. You have to share enough resources, resource management. You have a certain amount of resources. You can spend all your money. You can get rid of all your money. But that's something that's passed down in your genetics. It might be different. It might have been food back in the day. But all it is is a resource. And the way we spend our resources, you know, if you want to throw it all in the stock market or you're someone who wants to patiently invest... I think that's something that's very much influenced by genetics and passed down. So I think we have those instincts. This it's whether it's uh, fucking cryptocurrency or uh, mammoth jerky. At the end of the day, it's a resource, and how we use those resources uh, is part of our instincts. I agree. And at the same time, I think that's being too generic. Though I completely agree with your statement, I think to categorize every type of resource as just resource is too specific for the situation. If you, I imagine if you grew up in a, your ancestors grew up in a desert climate, you value water just naturally by your instincts more than food. And vice versa, if you go up in a land where there's lots of food but not a lot of water, you value food more than water. I think the classification of resources can't be all clumped together. I think that's very independent on the resource. So, I don't know, for some reason, a new technology, a new cell phone comes out. Yes, you can make the argument it's knowing how to use a technology, knowing how to use a skill makes that instinct more prevalent more sought after but it's a completely different subcategory so i agree with the whole resource thing but i think it changes on what it is so like apes apes for example apes use tools they use spears they use rocks etc etc it's a very sought after trait to use resources to help you gather more resources that's an overview but there's a lot larger difference between using a rock to smash open a, you know, a fruit husk versus using a spear to fish. Though they are both tools using to catch a resource, those tools are very different in mind thinking and instinct. And I, I, I just want to point that out. I don't know if you agree with that, Nick, or disagree with that. Yes, I, I agree with what you're saying, but... Let me kind of elaborate on the resources. So you're, we were talking about money, and let's compare money to a food resource. So what you're doing with those resources on a genetic reproductive level is we're trying to survive and reproduce. 
and we're using those things to do that. P the humans use humans have different levels of aversion to risk. It's kind of like a bell curve. Most of us are in the middle. Some people are on the ends. They either seek risk or are opposed to all risk. So most of us are, you know, like if you're going to invest in stocks for long term, if you have a long time, you're more likely to be a little bit more aggressive. If you're trying to make, you know, get rich quick, you're going to invest short in like a short period on some more aggressive ones. But then a lot of people will also invest on some like st stocks that are going to be pretty stable, right? So what you're doing there is you're using resources to try and, you know, make your money. But what are you using those resources to do? Survive, right? So these, whether it's, like I said, jerky in a tribe. So, so I guess... What so? What do you think we use resources for? Then I guess is where I'm con confused. I think humans are very different in nature because there are some humans who don't want to naturally pass on their genetic code, who naturally don't want kids, who naturally don't want to breed. There are people who are asexual, people who don't want their gene line to continue. That's unheard of in nature, but yet humans have that ability. And I think that changes the future. There might be some humans who just want to create money just for their own entertainment, their own self-preservation, not the preservation of their gene line. Those are two very different things in my mind of gather resources to help my tribe and further my bloodline versus gather resources to just to make myself happy and self-content without ever passing my gene line. But isn't being self-content survival? You're trying to ensure that you survive, right? If you're living paycheck to paycheck, you want to make more money so you don't have to worry about that. Like we said, the grass is always greener. Yes. If you and no. have enough money, you want to have enough money to where you don't need to work anymore. You want you you want to survive. You're working to survive, right? No. I would say most humans are working to survive. I agree with that. But when you're at a rich level and you're spending money on luxury items that you don't need, that have no use of resources to survival, just simply for shits and giggles, that's very different than spending money on resources. Those are two different things. That's why I think humans are very different than normal creatures. You are able to spend money on something that would not benefit us in any single way. Well, I would I would argue that because coming back to another thing humans do that's instinctual competition. So everything that we do is for the most part a competition. And let's say like purses. Purses are ridiculously expensive. However, it's a status symbol and humans put people into hierarchies. We judge people by certain things. And so what you're doing is you're you're saying, I have this level of status. I can do this, this, and this. And that will help you in certain situations. Yes, I agree with that. But I'd also add the counter argument of I'm a rich person. And as a child, I wanted this item not to show off, but just because I wanted it. So when I'm rich, I bought it like a comic book, a painting. And I might not show it to anyone. I might not even tell anyone about this. But I wanted it just for me. That'd be quite the opposite of what your argument just was. Yeah. But that's, uh, I mean, I feel like there's probably animals that do that too, like have a rock that they really like or something, or that might just be me. I don't know. So again, I agree this with- This is cool. I like this. <laughs> this is shiny. Ooh, shiny. Again, I agree with your statements. I just think the statements might be too generic. That's my only caveat of, no, I completely agree with you. Humans do a lot of things just to show social structures, social structure, just so they can mimic with certain crowds, get certain things, et cetera, et cetera. Or just they simply like it because it brings them happiness. Those happiness brings serotonin. So that instinct of whatever makes me happy, do it. Completely agree with. I completely agree with your statement. I just think it's too generic to put on every scenario. I think there's 
much more subcategories that can be manipulated or changed within one generation back to the original argument. Right. And I would agree with you, but I would say when you look at things evolution wise, you can't just look at single generations. You need to look at long term trends. See, this is where because, I, Yeah. This is where I say it's different with humans. So societal basis, right? If something comes into fashion, everyone wears green. That's just a society thing. That's within two generations. So then when you grow up as your kid, as you grow up as a kid and you see your parents, their favorite color is green, the chances of your favorite color being green, I would say, are most statistically higher just because societally that fashion was in season. So that's within two generations an instinct towards a certain color changed. And I would say that's quite possible with a lot of features for humans. Not all features. I would say... I would say 70% of all, this is just a generic number I come, percentage I come up with. I would say 70% of all human instincts cannot be manipulated. Those are thousands upon thousands, if not tens of thousands of years of genes. But I would say with humans, since we're so connected on a worldly scale and so able to adapt and change to certain scenarios that our instinct because our adaptability is so high that we're able to change our instinct on a high level. It might be it might be a fraction. It might be like I went from liking blue to liking turquoise. Something simple as that. But I would say that still changes your instinct and that gets passed on to the next generation. I would argue that that's a learned behavior and that but even that wouldn't be it or it's past it's like I said it's a, something you have I think we're talking in circles here, but you have you already have a proclivity to avoid certain things and do certain things, and then you're just filling that mold with what some of the adding to that. Like I know to avoid snakes and spiders, and I'm gonna avoid snakes and spiders as well as people who are menacing looking. Yes, but there are humans who overcome. But what that. is there are humans who love snakes and spiders? Yeah, and they're weirdos. <laughs> doesn't change the fact that they change their instinct of to fear the shadows, to fear the dark, to fear spiders and snakes. It's a... Well, that's genetic diversity. Not every single person has all the same instincts just based on their ancestors. If... Yeah, all right. I, I, I To move away from this conversation, because I think we're talking in circles. Okay. I want to ask you yep. another question that might lead us into circles, but it's very interesting. So you have... Person A, who has the instinct to be a certain way. So we'll just say adventurous. They are, person A is adventurous. And person B is a homebody. They don't want to leave the home, stuff like that. If they were to have a child, two people with very different instincts in their genetic code to have a child, how do you think that would affect both the child and society? Because we've all heard the expression, opposites attract. So... That's mixing instincts together. We might not all have, like you said, genetic diversity. We might not. We might have all different instincts. So what happens when you have different instincts mate together? What kind of offspring does that produce? So, all right, Hold, bear with me here. So one, I, I don't think this is a single gene expression. I think this is going to be a multitude of genes. So maybe whichever one is dominant, if that's the case. Now, I think that is going to be predominantly environmental motives. For example, if you don't know who your ancestors were, odds are you've been lower to middle class or your ancestors are lower to middle class. You're just farmers, laborers moving around wherever there's work. And I think that's going to continue to be the same for... A long time like i agree with that statement I, yeah like i have, I have no idea who the fuck my ancestors were where we came from or whatever we just moved around moved to america you know so i think it's going to be very dependent so say this child they grow up they go there's a school near the area and they can come back and get a get a job near that area or whatever, and they 
there's no stress that needs to move them out of there, they might never leave. You know, if I, I think it really depends on I think this is a lot more nurture than it is nature. However, if they are even if they're a homebody and they go to school near there, but they can't get a job. I think actually we're seeing a lot of this right now. I imagine there's a lot of jobs available. People don't want to move to them. So I would say maybe they might not move. Maybe they might just live with their parents until they can get a job in that area. Whereas for most of history, I would say people tended to move around to wherever there's work. So I agree and disagree. Which I guess proves your original point that instincts can be changed within a generation. Again, I agree with your statement that it takes generations to change an instinct. But to simply send it on a slightly different path, I can I can see that being happening in a generation or two. But to me, when you have a person A and person B, both with different instincts, different genetic diversity, have a baby, I think, again, I agree with the scenario that you're in. So... Though I agree that the alpha gene will have the first instinct, I still think that underlying instinct still plays a factor. I don't think that's completely turned off. So if person A is more risk taker and person B is more risk uh, avoidance, I still see the person taking that risk but hesitating more. Their gut instincts telling you, I want to do this, but hang on a second. Okay, now do this. That pause, that hesitation. I can see that being instincts passed on genetically, that, that, that gut feeling playing against each other. So you have two different instincts playing against each other, two different instincts running through, through scenarios in your brain to figure out what's going to happen. Yeah, I, I'd agree. And I think what maybe this comes down to isn't the genetics of traveling versus not traveling. It's the genetics and the instinct of risk aversion versus risk. I don't know. Take taking how, how you manage risk, I guess would be the biggest factor in here. And, and maybe that's what it is in, in total, like just genetically how inclined to risk you are. Like we talked about, difference between me and my brother and who's willing to take what risks maybe that's all genetics yeah it's a it's a strong possibility and i am curious though for those listening on when has instinct played a major role in your life when has instinct made you go zig instead of zag i imagine everyone has had that epiphany moment that moment in their life where they did something without thinking. They just trusted their gut for it. And Nick, where could they find us where if they wanted to tell us their scenario with instinct? You can find us on Instagram and YouTube. Can they find us on Twitter? Uh, no, because I would, some would argue that is where a lot of people's instincts are <laughs> coming out. Like, I wouldn't really talk about it that much, but human emotion is kind of an instinct being hurt, being aggressive, not wanting to be wrong. That's very instinctive to people to toughen up and not accept the other side. We don't oh, want to be to wrong. Dig in? Absolutely. Do you want to, do you want to talk about that for a second? Um, I mean, there's not much else to say unless you had something else. No, I just completely agree with that statement that humans, once we find a side, we tend to sync with it. It's our instinct to, to make a choice and not change, to think that we are right and never wrong. And uh, what are you reading, Mike? I actually am reading Dune again. Uh, they, I don't know if it they've announced it earlier, but they announced Dune mo new Dune movie is coming out in the fall time, and we talked about it in a previous podcast, which you can check out Backyard Philosophy or anywhere you listen to podcasts or YouTube. I love Dune, so I am uh, rereading it. What about you, Nick? What are you reading? I am reading uh, Wayfinding still, the science and technology of how humans navigate the globe. And since it kind of applies to this one on audiobook, I'm at work. I'm listening to The Red Queen 
the science of like sexual selection, genetic selection, and ass and titties, <laughs> ass and titties, <laughs> and it's pretty interesting. But uh, yeah, that Thanks sounds for like a very interesting read. Yeah, it's kind of a tough one to listen to, or it's it's one of those books where you're like, oh, I should have read this so I could comprehend it better. So nah. I got to keep my audiobook nah. listening a little lighter. Nah. Just something's always better than nothing. All right. That's it. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on